So, assalamu alaikum again and welcome to everyone um, to the first lecture of Quantum Computing for Beginners and Online Lecture Series. These lectures will be delivered by Dr. Mohammed Sabi Anwar and they are being organized by the Khwarizmi Science Society. Um, if you're not aware, then the Khwarizmi Science Society is um, basically it's a scientific uh, science society. It's a movement which is working to popularize science in Pakistan. And we mainly organize events uh, like this, these lecture series, but we also have other events such as the Lahore Science Mela. You can find out more about us on these websites uh, given over here, either forestme.org or kssllsm.org. And you can also send your any questions or concerns at info at forestme.org. Okay, so um, here are some important rules which uh, we expect all of you to go through and um, follow. The first one being that um, please make sure that the display name, can you see my screen? Uh, wait, yeah. So that the display name of yours on Zoom represents your actual name. That is the name you've registered uh, with uh, in these online lecture series. So it should not be displaying the name of your device or anything else. And you can also add the name of your country at the end. Like for example, if it's Pakistan, you can write Pakistan. If it's Jordan, you can write Jordan or any other country. You can also rename yourself while during the meeting. So if you did not have the correct name, you can fix it right now. Um, the second uh, rule is that um, the last 10 minutes of the session are going to be dedicated to question and answers. Therefore, please do not worry if you have any questions, then uh, instead of interrupting uh, the instructor during his lecture, you're advised to wait for the last 10 minutes and, and ask your questions then. You can type your question in the chat or you can just um, signify that you have a question and I'll come over and I'll read out your name or your question and only speak once your name is uh, called out by me or the instructor. Do not unmute your mics otherwise. And um, so obviously to, to avoid any interruptions, distractions or background noise, we advise all of you to keep your mics muted throughout the lecture, unless of course you're asking something in the question and answer session. Fourth is that please avoid any interruptions. And again, if you have any concerns, if there's any pressing concern, then you can write it in the chat box. You can also privately message it to me. So um, avoid disrupting the entire class. The fifth is that please try to always be on time. This is um, very important for all the coming lectures as well. We expect you to join at least the waiting uh, room at least 10 minutes before the lecture starts. And finally, we hope that you take full advantage of this opportunity, that you listen very carefully to the lectures, you take your notes, and you actually learn something from this, and that this is a rich learning experience for you. So um, if there are any more instructions or details, we are also going to be forwarding them to you through email. So please, you're also advised to check your emails very regularly. So that's it from my side. Uh, now over to Dr. Sabi. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and Assalamu Alaikum to everyone. Uh, I would really like to welcome you and thank all of you to be a part of this online lecture series. Uh, we received a lot of registrations uh, and we had to be slightly selective uh, in, in the class size. So I really thank you from the core of my heart and from the team of the Khwarizmi Science Society. So uh, my name is Mohammed Sabi Anwar. Uh, I'll take you through these eight lectures uh, in a lightning fast fashion uh, on, on a cruise which will introduce to you quantum computing. So basically this is meant as a series for absolute beginners. The only prerequisite that I assume you would have is some basic knowledge of matrices, vectors, column vectors and row vectors and how matrices are multiplied. I would also expect that you would have some working knowledge of complex numbers. Uh, quantum computing, uh, complex as it sounds, uses complex numbers uh, quite a bit. And of course, I would expect you to know the basics of modern physics as is generally covered in your FSC or A level or grade 12 syllabi. Uh, so I'll stick to the very basics, but I hope at the end of the eighth lecture, you'll have a good working knowledge of what quantum computers are, 
why uh, there is a lot of uh, fuss about quantum computers? Why do they attract global attention? Why are governments spending billions of dollars on quantum computing initiatives? What, what promise do they harbor? And uh, how is information quantum mechanical? What is the relationship between computing and quantum mechanics? So uh, Mosina has already uh, covered some of the basic rules. Uh, I would mostly uh, do scribbling on, on, a, on a notepad. So that's what we did. Uh, the classroom environment because quantum computing after all is a mathematical subject. So I, I will resort to, uh, to a, a screen on, on which I will type and I would expect that you would take notes as you go along. Uh, I hope uh, my voice is audible and uh, I wish all of you best of luck and let's get started. So uh, let me share my screen. Uh, as Mosina mentioned, you're always welcome to uh, type in the chat box. And if there's a pressing question, uh, I'll try to stop my argument or finish my argument and answer that question. But the last 10 minutes, I will reserve uh, exclusively for question and answers. Uh, this is the first time I'm teaching online uh, such a course, so I think there will be there could be some distractions, some digressions here and there, but overall I assume that it's going to be a, a delightful experience for myself as well as for all of you. All right, so let's get started. So this is our first lecture on quantum computing. Now we all know what computing is. Uh, the computers that we use uh, in our daily lives, they work with a number system, which is called a binary system, in which information, whatever information that we would like to deal with is translated into a stream of zeros, and ones. And so on. So anything that we write, any email that we compose, any image that we see, any color that we observe, any algorithm that we write, after all, it is translated into this stream of zeros and ones. Now, where does the zero and one come from? The zero and one basically represents some physical property of a physical device. For example, let's, let's look at an example. Suppose I have what is called a transistor. So this is a symbol for a transistor and I attach one. So the transistor has three terminals. It has a base, it has an emitter and it has a collector. So a transistor acts like a valve. If a current goes into the base, then some larger current can flow from the collector to the emitter. And when a current flows from the collector to the emitter, the transistor can change its state. So if I input a current into the base, the transistor is switched on and this large current from point A to the ground terminal starts flowing. And when there's a current flowing from the collector to the emitter, a voltage will develop across this resistor. So if I apply a voltage here, say 10 volts, then all of this voltage will be will drop across this resistor and the voltage at this point will switch or will become close to the voltage at the ground terminal, which is zero volts. However, if I switch off the input current, there is no current flowing from the emitter to the base. 
which means that this point C here must be at the same voltage as point A, which is 10 volts. Therefore, depending upon whether a current goes into the base, I can toggle the state of the voltage at this point at the collector. So I can switch between zero volts, 10 volts. I can remain at 10 volts. I can remain at 10 volts. I can go down to zero volts and so on. So now I could translate these two levels, zero and 10 volts into a logical zero and a logical one. So, so this logical information, zeros and ones, basically arises from some kind of physical device. And there is some physical process that is at work. Now, this is a totally classical device. The transistor can be described by laws of uh, classical physics, which are average quantum mechanical laws. So it, enter the quantum world. In the quantum world, we also have devices, objects, which are really quantum objects. And in its simplest form, each quantum object can have a physical property that can take up two possibilities. These two possibilities are called states. Let me give you some examples of quantum states. Suppose I have a, a proton. Now, a proton, as you know, is a subatomic particle, an elementary particle, really small. And the proton has a property that is called spin. Now, because of its spin, it acts like a tiny, tiny magnet. And since it's a tiny magnet, it also responds to an external magnetic field. All right. Suppose I draw the magnetic field by, by arrows pointing upwards. And I place the magnet, the, the proton inside this magnetic field. So let me use the symbol B for a magnetic field. Now I would like to uh, draw, uh, I would like to draw a proton here. So let me use a different color. So here is my proton. Now the proton, of course, is not a, a sphere. This is just a cartoonic representation of a proton. But since it is a tiny magnet, it also has a direction associated with it, which is called a magnetic dipole. Now suppose uh, on, on this side of the screen, I, I draw the magnet associated with a proton. Now, when I draw this arrow, this is the arrow for a magnet, which comes out from the spin, which is the spin of the proton. So I'm talking here about the spin of the proton and the relevant degree of freedom is the spin of the proton. Now, this arrow represents the following. Uh, the proton is just like a tiny magnet with a north pole here and a south pole here. Now, if I were to take this proton, this object, and place it inside the magnetic field, then there are two possibilities. In fact, an infinite variety of possibilities, but just let's look at two possibilities. One possibility is that the dipole is aligned with the external magnetic field. And the other possibility is the orthogonal possibility, the exact opposite possibility is that the dipole is anti-parallel to the external magnetic field. Now we have two configurations of this tiny dipole, this magnet. Just like the example of a transistor in which we have two states, one we've logically labeled as zero, the other, we've logically labeled as one. 
in this quantum mechanical case which corresponds to a proton let's for for the desire of our little hearts label these two configurations as say 0 and 1 so if the spin points parallel to the magnetic field this is the state 0 and if it's anti parallel to the field it's the state 1 now since this is a quantum mechanical object we would be really happy if we were to call this a quantum state now quantum mechanics is not that simple since we're dealing with quantum objects here we would like to use a special notation and that notation is called the Dirac notation so this zero is a label for the proton for the quantum state of a proton and we'll be really happy if we were to put this label inside this strange looking symbol which is called a ket and this the other orthogonal state in in a similar uh, in a similar paraphrasal which is ket1 so now we have a proton and we've identified two logical states one of them is ket0 and one of them is get one. Now a proton when placed inside this magnetic field could, uh, let's assume for simplicity, it could be in either of these states, either get zero or get one. Now, of course, this is what is logically expected. Uh, just like a transistor, the output on the emitter terminal of a transistor, the output that we see here, this point, this point here, this thing here, the output here at this point could either be zero or 10 volt, volts. So these outputs are mutually exclusive. You can't have five volts or four volts or six volts because this transistor is really acting like a switch here. And a switch only has two states. It can toggle between two states, on, off, on, off. There's nothing in between. However, for a quantum mechanical object, the possibilities are infinite. Now, if you're talking about a proton and the spin of a proton, which is one specific degree of freedom, uh, the state could be zero or one, but quantum mechanically, it could also be in what is called, and I'm putting this in red color because it's such an important concept. The object could be in a superposition quantum state. All right, now in, in the Dirac notation or in quantum mechanics, generally when we deal with quantum information and quantum computing, we represent states, the general form of a state and we use Greek symbols for that. For example, if I were to write a general state psi, which corresponds to the spin degree of freedom of a proton, I need to put it inside a ket symbol, which tells us that this is indeed a quantum state. Uh, now, of course, the proton spin can be aligned with the field. In that case, the state is ket zero. I could also have a scenario in which the proton is anti-parallel to the field. Then the quantum state would be ket one. But I could also have a scenario in which, so let me draw redraw uh, the magnetic field. So here is my magnetic field. And if I were to draw the proton now, the spin of the proton, I could have the spin of the proton in a horizontal plane. Okay. So it's in the horizontal plane, whereas the magnetic field is vertical. Now, how do we represent the quantum state of such a proton? 
and this is quantum mechanically possible we can have the spin uh, physically perpendicular to the magnetic field so this is physical perpendicularity now quantum mechanics tells us that this is indeed possible and you can write down the quantum state the quantum state is now going to be a superposition so the quantum state is now going to be a superposition of ket 0 sorry ket 0 and ket 1 and i can represent the superposition by a plus sign now remember that this pl plus is not normal addition it is not the addition that we learn about in our kindergarten here we are superposing quantum state so this plus sign has a special meaning and just uh, you some of you might already know this that if i were to write a legitimate quantum mechanical state i need to put in a factor of 1 over under root 2 and a factor of 1 over under root 2 here and i'll explain later where this factor comes from so this is an example of a quantum mechanical object a proton which possesses a quantum mechanical property the spin by virtue of which it acts like a bit a bit so in in normal computers you have bits which could be in zero and one state here in the quantum realm you also have these objects and this kind of information which is not really a bit it's a quantum bit which you would like to abbreviate you take the q u from here and you take this bit and conjoin the two together and you form a qubit and the qubit is the working unit of a simple quantum computer. Now we've talked about uh, the, the spin of a proton. We, we, we have other examples as well. We could have the spin of an electron. Yes, if there are any questions here, I, I could take a question or two. All right, so let's move on. Uh, Mosina, if you keep, if you can keep an eye on the chat box, that would be really helpful. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Sir, I have a question. Yes, please. So you have it uh, right over there is like a, a psi in a cat and cat uh, equals to um, uh, the notation of uh, zero with a cat plus psi plus uh, one with the cat. So uh, you are saying that it's uh, it's the superposition of two states, and then yes. you uh, uh, next right over there that divided by under root two. What is that? Q, uh, qubit is zero or zero uh, zero cat uh, plus one cat, or uh, the division of under root two, please. So, the, so there are two points. One is that this plus does not represent normal addition, arithmetic addition. It represents here when we write this thing okay when we write this thing over here zero plus one this represents the state of a proton the spin of a proton the quantum state all right and this one over under root two that which is in the denominator is there to preserve the probabilities and i'll talk about this later okay okay thank you thank you so so just as we have a proton. <clears throat> Sir, there's yes. a question. Uh, yeah. Yes. There's a question from uh, Rana Imran. He says how quantum bit is different from normal bit and byte. Yeah, a bit, a bit does not exist in a superposition, whereas a quantum bit exists, can exist, as a superposition, and that is where the real power of quantum computers comes from, and we'll look at many examples of this. So this idea is central to the idea of quantum computers. And when we talk about interferometers in our next class, which is tomorrow, you'll actually see the beauty and the power of this concept of superposition. So if I were to take another example, 
so the proton is a physical example. Another physical example is that of an electron. An electron is a charged particle, as you all know, and it also carries a spin. Anything that has a quantum mechanical spin acts like a tiny magnet. All right. So instead of looking at the spin of a proton, you could also look at the spin of an electron and place this electron inside a magnetic field. And you could do the same things with an electron, the spin of an electron instead of a proton. And the same language of get zeros, get ones is used to describe the spin of an electron. Yet another example. Suppose I'm talking about light. Now light comprises, as you know, of tiny packets of energy, which are called photons. Now light is really a wave, a transverse wave. And what is waving here? It is really an electric field that is going up, coming down, reversing its direction, turning around again, and so on. And this, the photon is propagating in some direction. This is the direction of propagation. But the electric field is going up and down transverse to the direction of propagation. So the direction in which the electric field is oscillating is called the polarization of, of light. Now you can observe that if the propagation is from left to right, the polarization is vertical. So this kind of light possesses what is called vertical polarization. Uh, you all know that light is a transverse wave. So this is one possibility. But then of course, there's another possibility. You see how I am motivating quantum qubits and quantum mechanical objects and their states by, by invoking examples that you already know from your grade 11, grade 12, grade 9 or grade 10 physics. The other possibility, of course, is, is the following. We have propagation in the same direction, but now the electric field is horizontally polarized. So let me try drawing this. All right, not really good at drawing, but this is the best that I could do here. The electric field now is going up from a minimum value, then decreasing, then changing its direction, going up, going down, going up, and so on. So the, the yellow represents the electric field. We all know that light is an electromagnetic wave with an electric field that oscillates uh, perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Now, just as the vertical polarization is a legitimate polarization, we have this condition of horizontal polarization. And if we are dealing with single photons, one photon at a time, so the light that comes out from the bulb that is here or laser or the sunlight comprises millions, billions, trillions and humongous number of photons. But somehow, if I could attenuate the light or I could have some mechanism or technology that produces just a single photon, that single photon will carry all the properties of the wave as well it will be polarized. And now I have identified a degree of freedom, the polarization which can exist in two states. I could call the vertical polarization sket zero, and I could call the horizontal polarization sket one. Now the photon is a quantum mechanical prop object. Its polarization is our requisite degree of freedom. And I could do quantum computing with a photon as well. 
and look at its polarization. The polarization is my relevant degree of freedom. I'm manipulating the polarization degree of freedom. So I could do quantum computing with protons, with the spin of electrons, with the polarization of photons, etc. So one, one idea, quantum computing described by common language, the Dirac notation can have multiple physical manifestations. So one idea, one language, which is the Dirac language, can have multiple manifestations. I could talk about a proton spin. I could talk about the electron spin. I could talk about the polarization of a photon. So if I look at this polarization state head on. So this is how I view this polarization state. And so what I will observe is that the polarization is horizontal. I could have the polarization being vertical. And lo and behold, I can also have the polarization being at 45 degrees with respect to the horizontal. The polarization being 135 degrees with respect to the horizontal. The polarization being at any angle with respect to the horizontal. So how would I write down the quantum state in Dirac notation for, for this thing? This state is nothing but a superposition of ket zero and ket one. And since it's at 45 degrees exactly, I could put a one over under root two here. And this one over under root two is simply, so this is the quantum state of a photon. Once again, represented by ket psi, this one over under root two is simply cosine of 45 degrees, ket zero plus sine of 45 degrees, ket one. So this becomes one over under root two, ket zero, plus one over under root two, cat one. All right, so you now have some idea of where this one over under root two comes from. If on the other hand, I would like to look at this polarization state, which is at, let me redraw it. I'm looking at the polarization heads on, the electric field vector is now inclined at some angle theta with respect to the horizontal, perfectly legitimate polarization. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing special about horizontal or vertical. Now, this particular quantum state can also be written in Dirac notation, ket psi. I always write kets because it is a quantum state. And this quantum state in its general form is cosine of this angle theta ket zero plus sine of theta ket one. All right, so I can have multiple physical manifestations of all of the examples that I've given are of qubits because they are they are two levels here a cat zero and a cat one uh, <clears throat> one or two more examples i would just like to give one or two more examples here just for the sake of completeness suppose i have a mirror now this is my symbol for a mirror and this is a special kind of mirror. And the property of this mirror, it's really called a beam splitter, is the following. If light comes in, and in quantum mechanical language, light is a photon. If a photon strikes this mirror, there is a certain 
probability. Now, this is the first time I'm using this word. Probability, as you know, is at the heart of quantum computers. This beam splitter has a proper property that there's a 50% probability. So let me draw two arrows here to represent the incoming photon. There's a 50% probability that this photon will be transmitted and a 50% probability that this photon is reflected. If this were a perfect 50-50 beam splitter. Now, instead of the polarization degree of freedom, I can look at the path of a photon. And now my path becomes the relevant spin of uh, the relevant degree of freedom. I can call this transmitted path cat zero, and I can call this reflected path cat one. All right, so so I could therefore use the polarization degree of freedom, uh, the polarization or the path of a photon, the direction in which a photon moves. One of the most important technologies these days for quantum computers are called squids, superconducting quantum interference devices. Now, a squid is a ring of a superconductor So this is my super connector here. And there's a narrow gap here or a barrier. And there is an insulator in this barrier. Now this is a quantum mechanical object. And the property of this quantum mechanical object is that the, of course, when a current flows through this device, associated with any loop of current there is a magnetic field so when a current flows through this uh, superconducting coil ring it will produce a magnetic field so if this is my current there's going to be a magnetic field coming out inside this region what is and associated with a magnetic field there is a flux phi and the flux is going to be the product of the strength of this magnetic field and the surface area. Now, the property of these squids is that this flux becomes quantized. Either you can have you can have one unit of flux, which is called fluxon, or you could have none. You can't have anything in between. So this is an example of a flux qubit. And you can associate it, the presence of flux with cat zero and the absence of flux by cat one. You could also use this current here as your degree of freedom. So you can have a current flowing anti-clockwise and a current that is flowing clockwise. And you can call this cat zero, you can call this cat one. So the key idea is, my friends, a quantum computer it has a working unit. The simplest quantum computer has a working unit called a qubit. And a qubit can take up a variety of physical forms. We looked at examples of protons, of electrons, of photons. And there's a race between different physical technologies as to which technology comes up with the largest number of qubits to build a quantum computer that can do something really useful. So far, the race is being won by squids, superconducting quantum interference devices. But all of these platforms and technologies use a common universal language. And that is the language proposed by Dirac. Now, let me uh, uh, do a slight di digression here and just do a quick recap of complex numbers because now I'm going to talk about general quantum states. So I can take a question or two here. I'm um, sorry, there's some, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, firstly, your video isn't moving. Uh, the screen is working perfectly fine. It's your video. Okay. 
for the moment. Secondly, right, there so... were two questions asked previously. First is by Amen. She says that can a proton only be in superposition if it uh, if it is perpendicular to the field? Yeah, if it okay, let me just uh, also try. The, yes, if a pro if a proton spin is perpendicular to the magnetic field, it's it's going to be in a superposition. But you you learn more about this in a minute. Let me stop my video and restart it. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. So the second question is by Madhya. She says that if the proton is not in horizontal state, will it always collapse in ket zero or ket one state? Yeah, I'm going to come to the uh, measurement problem in a minute. Uh, so if I can add, Assalamu alaikum, my name is Madiha. Yeah. I just wanted to ask that um, a proton, uh, when it is not present in an external magnetic field, when it's not being measured, so it's in, in a slightly, it, it, either it's horizontal or vertical or in between. So uh, can we, uh, can we, uh, denoted by superposition when it's not present in an external magnetic field? When it's not, you see, this is the strange problem of measurement. When it's not in a magnetic field, you don't know what it is, what state it is, is it in. So you but need it to is in a superposition state. So, so we can you write it in a ket. How, uh, how do you know it's in a superposition state? So we 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 can uh, give it the the magnitude which are which you're going to write the complex numbers and the magnitude of uh, um, of uh, the shadow which is uh, on this zero ket and the shadow which is on the one ket probability of collapsing it as a zero ket and pro probability of collapsing it as a one ket. Yeah, but I I don't think you can you can say for sure what state is it is it in unless you prepared the quantum state in a particular fashion. So you need to have an external magnetic field or anything uh, anything. You that... need to have an external magnetic field to actually define a basis to define cat and zero. Without an external magnetic field, there is no unique direction. So you cannot talk about cat zero and cat one. Okay. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, my video is not working, but I hope that's all right. Uh, we'll I'll figure that out later. Just me, I just don't, don't want to waste my time on yeah. getting my video. Just one more question, sir. Uh, Rabia yes. is asking the ket zero uh, for anti clockwise and ket one for clockwise is arbitrary, or we use vice versa conditions for that? It's arbitrary, it doesn't matter. You just need to have access to these two states. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, what's the difference between uh, uh, between the superposition in quantum and the continuum state in classical? Uh, we know that the quantum have a discrete uh, quantum state, and this is a special concept in quantum. We we don't have this concept in classical. But in between we what's the difference between it and classical concept you see the uh, superposition is a very general concept it applies to both quantum mechanical systems as well as classical systems suppose i have i draw a wave here so this is a classical wave, say a water wave. So what I could have is this wave is interfering with the wave that is totally 180 degrees out of phase. So now I have a superposition of two classical waves and these waves are giving me interference. So this concept of superposition is totally arbitrary. It applies to classical as well as quantum mechanical systems. And even though quantum mechanical systems are generally, when we teach quantum mechanics, it's discrete, we can have continuous variable quantum mechanical systems. For example, let's talk about an electron. Suppose I draw two walls and these are impenetrable walls and the electron is 
somewhere in between these walls and it's bouncing off right it's reflecting from the walls and so it's in an it's doomed to exist between these walls and my degree of freedom is the position of the electron so this position is denoted as zero let's call this position l so now if i were to measure the position of the electron the electron of course is a quantum mechanical object if i were to measure the position then my degree of freedom becomes position and i can put this inside a cat now even though it's a quantum mechanical system this is an example of a continuous variable quantum mechanical system so these concepts are totally general general and uh, they work uh, both in the classical realm as well as in the quantum mechanical realm okay now quick overview of uh, of complex numbers i hope you all know what complex numbers are so uh, i i can represent a complex number by z a complex number can have a real part and an imaginary part and this number can also be represented so this representation is called the cartesian or the rectangular representation and this number could also be represented alternatively in a polar form so in the polar form uh, the number will have a magnitude and some angle phi so the magnitude is calculated by looking at the square of 3 the real part the square of the imaginary part 9 plus 16 25 take the under root i get 5 and the phase or this thing over here phi is calculated by looking at the inverse tan of the imaginary part divided by the real part all right so whenever i have a complex number i can always take its conjugate which i can represent by z star and in order to do that i just invert the sign of the imaginary part and i also know that the if i were to take the modulus square of a complex number then it is found out by multiplying the the complex number with its conjugate so this is a really fast lightning fast introduction to uh, complex numbers and now let's talk about quantum states so we're talking about quantum mechanics and quantum states are what interest us at the moment all right now i would like to finish off this lecture in the next 10 minutes by introducing the most general way of writing a qubit because qubits are the workhorse of uh of uh, of quantum computers so it's really important to understand this part so let me try to uh, just just give me a second i just try to restart my camera here Uh, if it works otherwise we'll just live without it for for today I'm sorry we'll have to live without the my camera for today. All right. So now let's write down the most general form of a quantum state of a qubit. Now a qubit basically has two levels. It has two states that we're talking about. one of them is cat 0 and the other is cat 1 okay just let me 
I need some more space here. Okay. So in its most general form, a quantum state, Psi, this is my quantum state. can be in a superposition of cat zero and one. So immediately I would write a plus sign, but now I need some coefficients here. I need a coefficient here and I need a coefficient here. Now the strange thing about quantum mechanics, which makes it different from classical mechanics is that these coefficients could be complex numbers. All right, so I could have a complex number here. Let's call it C0 and a complex number here, C1. So C0 and C1, both of them are complex numbers. And this is what the strange thing about quantum mechanics is. All right, now this complex number C naught, I can always write this complex number. So this is one, one way of representing a quantum state. Let's look at another way. This psi, of course, is a superposition of cat zero and cat one. Okay. One more prescription for writing the coefficients. I could write a coefficient here, which is cosine of some number theta over two, some number theta over two. Okay. And then I can write a coefficient sine theta over two here. And additionally, I write a complex number E I phi. This form is an extremely useful way of writing a qubit, the state of a qubit, a quantum mechanical system. Now theta is a real number and phi is also a real number. Both of them are real numbers. Now let's see why this is making sense. Suppose my quantum state is simply cat zero. This is my first example. If this were the case, then my theta, this would apply when theta is zero. So if theta were zero, this coefficient would become one. This coefficient would become zero. And it doesn't matter what phi is. So phi becomes irrelevant. Okay, hence this state that I've written here, let's call this state A the way in which I've written a quantum state does explain cat zero, which is a, just a particular case of the general form that I've written, which I put in the red box. Let's look at another example. If my quantum state were cat one, this would really mean that my theta is 180 degrees, which is pi, and my phi is zero. Let's see if this makes sense. If my theta were here, let, let me use the pointer here. So if this theta here were 180 degrees, then cosine of 90 would become zero, as it should be, because the state that I'm talking about is cat one. If my theta were 180 degrees, then this number would become one because sine of 90 is one. And I would need 
the coefficient here that I'm talking about is one, and that one is achieved when this phi is zero. Now suppose my quantum state were the superposition state, example three, one over under root two, cat zero, plus one over under root two, cat one. In this case, uh, can anyone tell me uh, what what does this correspond to? What is theta here and what is phi? You can just speak up, please. Theta equals uh, 45. Uh, not 45, no. Theta is 90 degrees. Over two. Theta is 90 degrees or pi by 2. Mm -hmm. And phi? Zero. Phi is zero. Good. Uh, remember, the theta is not 45, theta is 90 because here we have this factor of 2 built in because it's a spin half system. Uh, therefore, we really have to be cognizant of this factor of 2 here. All right, so the, let me write down an example 4. Really interesting. Cat psi is 1 over under root 2 cat 0 plus iota over under root 2 cat 1. There's nothing stopping you from having complex numbers here, right? So this particular quantum state is once again going to be described by theta. Can you just speak up? 90 degrees. And what's the value of phi here? 90 degrees. Phi is again 90 degrees. Thank you. All right. That's really nice. So, hence any quantum mechanical state of a qubit can be represented by this general form that I put in, put in a red box here. This thing. this thing and we all like pretty pictures don't we so we would like to draw a picture for this and the picture that we would like to draw is what is called a block sphere All right, so let me draw a sphere. Now, this is a really important concept and it's going to live with us for the remainder of the seven lectures. So, this is my sphere. Of course, it's a three dimensional object that I'm trying to draw on a two dimensional screen. There's a north pole here and a south pole here. Suppose my quantum states live on this block sphere in, in some advanced, uh, in an advanced sense, this block sphere represents a Hilbert space. Don't worry if you don't understand this. Now there's a North Pole. Suppose if my quantum state were kept zero, it lives on the North Pole. And if my quantum state were cat one, it lives on the south pole. So, so a quantum state lives somewhere on the sphere, somewhere on the sphere. Let, let, me, let me look at some specific examples. Example number one. Example number one, cat zero. I know it lives on the north pole. Cat one, I know it lives on the south pole. Let's look, look at example number three here. All right, this corresponds to theta equals 90 degrees and phi equals zero. Now let me just postulate that this state lives here. So if I were to just for our reference draw 
these fiducial lines, this state that I've drawn in red here is cat zero plus cat one over under root two. It's a superposition state. Now, how do we how do I know that? Because if we were to draw axes, let me draw axes. So this is my z axis, my x axis, my y axis. And if I were to take define an angle theta, which is the angle that comes downward from the z axis, then this state here corresponds to theta equals 90 degrees. But then there's the possibility that I can move along this equatorial plane. So my state could be here on the x axis or it could be here on the y axis or it could be here at the minus x axis. It could be here at the minus y axis. So if it were, if it were to be on the y axis, which corresponds to my example four here, it really means that my phi, I have to define an angle phi, which is 90 degrees. And that angle is this particular angle, the generally called the azimuthal angle. So if my angle phi were to be 180 degrees, then I would get this state over here, which corresponds to cat zero minus cat one over under root two. If I were to make phi equals three pi by two, I would land over here, which would make my state cat zero minus iota cat one over under root two. But there's nothing special about these cardinal points. I could be at the North Pole, South Pole, X, Y, minus X, minus Y. Rather, I could be anywhere on the block sphere. <laughs> there's nothing special about these card. I could be here. I could be here. I could be anywhere on the block sphere. So let me draw the most general form. Here is my block sphere. Suppose my quantum state lives on this block sphere and it's here, somewhere here in the northern hemisphere. Let me draw the axes again, just for convenience. Don't read into these axes too much. This is not X, Y, Z. There's nothing classical here. Let me now define the angles. If I draw a vector from my quantum state to the origin, this angle of co-latitude, I call it theta. And then I drop down a shadow onto the equatorial plane here. Sorry, it's just slightly. If I were to draw this shadow here, draw a vector here on the equatorial plane, this angle would correspond to phi. And this quantum state, you can see for yourself, is defined by cosine theta by 2, cat 0, plus sine theta by 2, e i phi, cat 1. And then you can put in different kinds of theta and values of theta and phi and see how this quantum state navigates the block sphere. All right, so just try putting in theta equals 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 180 degrees. You will traverse all points on the block sphere. Immediately the concept of parallelism comes to the fore. Even though we just have two quantum states, the values of theta and phi, which this qubit can traverse, they are infinite, really infinite. So the Hilbert space is really a big, 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 large space. And that is where the power of quantum computers comes from. 
Now in tomorrow's lecture, I'm going to talk about interferometers. I'm going to talk a little bit about measurement and look at some really interesting aspects of, uh, of, of, of this concept. And tomorrow we'll see our first quantum computer. We'll build upon these ideas and see how these quantum computers, uh, we, we, we'll appreciate how these begin uh, to work. So I'm now ready to take up some questions and I'm sorry my video has just gone berserk right now, but I'll try to fix it before uh, the meeting tomorrow. So I'll be happy to take questions. Um, sir, there's this one question Sarah Abdul Razak had asked earlier. She says, are squids what is usually used in quantum computers? Yes. So all the quantum computers that are generally contending uh, these days for quantum ascendancy, they are based upon squids. Yes, any more questions? So oh. there's another question. Yeah, have you seen it? The, there's a lot of representations of qubits. Well, all of these representations are, uh, they're just representations. One of them can be interconverted to another, like a complex number. Uh, could be represented in a polar form, rectangular form. Uh, the position on a sphere can have different kinds of representations. You could use spherical coordinates, polar coordinates, azimuthal coordinates, cylindrical coordinates. So these are just representations. And the kind of representation that we use depends upon what helps us the most. So even though they're different representations, they are for our convenience. So any more questions, you're welcome to speak up. You, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and speak up as well. Uh, is, the, is the pace of the lecture all right? Uh, any, any feedback that can help me in the forthcoming lectures, that will be really useful. No, sir, I enjoyed a lot. Thank all right, you so how, did, how did theta over two come? Well, you, you can see that theta over two works. So the factor of one over two really comes out from the fact that we are dealing with spin half systems. If we have spin, uh, uh, spin one systems or spin three over two systems, then this half factor of half would not appear. So looking at the block sphere, everything works out if we have this th th uh, factor of two. Otherwise, everything is going to go topsy-turvy. So this factor of two represents the spin. A qubit, any qubit, is a fictitious spin. Any two-level quantum system can be modeled as a spin. That's why spin half systems are really important. Even when we talk about currents in a squid, it is equivalent to a spin half system because it can be described by the same language. That's why qubits are really important. And the spin half system works as an archetypal example. It works as a prime example, a universal example that describes different physical manifestations. Yes, sir, thank you so much for the lecture. Uh, I would like to ask you, that, uh, how do you prepare uh, a, a, a qubit in a particular state? You, you, you mentioned that you, know, you, can, you can prepare them. And uh, I, I understand you measure them using a, a certain basis set. And uh, the measurement depends upon uh, which basis set you use. But how do you prepare them in a particular quantum state from the beginning? That's my question. All right, so let me give you an example. Uh, suppose I have uh, Okay, let me give you an example here. Suppose I have a beam splitter. And this beam splitter has a special property. If a photon comes in, 
with a certain polarization. The photon has a quantum state psi. Certain polarization, it could be a superposition. Now this beam splitter has a property that if the photon it goes out and is transmitted, then the polarization is horizontal. And if the photon is reflected, then we know that its polarization is vertical. And we know that horizontal may correspond to ket 0, vertical may correspond to ket 1. Now suppose somehow I put a screen here, a blockage or a dump, which means I don't care what, what's coming out here. This is a don't care condition. I don't really bother what output I get here. Now, if I have a detector here, so I represent this detector by a D symbol, put a wiggly, uh, wiggly cable with it. If I see something here, so if I see something here, I'm 100% certain that this photon will have a polarization ket zero. Okay. Now, uh, if I were to prepare this quantum state in a superposition of 0 and 1, then 50% of the times I would get a photon here. But whenever I get a photon in this channel, this channel, I know that it has been, it is in the state cat 0 or in other words, it has been prepared in the state cat 0. Now, each physical implementation has a different mechanism of preparing quantum states. If you talk about spins, you put them in a really large magnetic field, they will all align with the external magnetic field if the temperature is small enough. And that is how you prepare a quantum state. So the problem with quantum computers is that it is difficult, number one, to prepare quantum states. Number two, it's difficult to measure quantum states. Because when you measure quantum states, the state changes or collapses. And it's difficult to preserve superposition. And this is the phenomenon of decoherence. We'll talk about this. So I hope I've answered your question. Preparation of quantum states is possible, but it's really difficult at the same time. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm um, sorry, there's a few questions. Um, the first one is by Rana Imran. He says that it's direct notation, the only notation to represent qubits. Well, for pure quantum states, yes. For impure quantum states, you need the concept of density matrix. Okay, so there's also a comment by um, Sir Park Riyaz. He says that the pace of the lecture is too fast. I'd appreciate if we focus on fundamental concepts more. It's too fast. Okay, but we have to cover some grounds here. Uh, so uh, I, I'll try to also upload some um, reading material on the Google Classroom, which you which you prepared. So I, I'll try to strike a balance. Yes. So Kani um, Zamna and Hanati they have asked for useful book or related reading material too. All right. Um, okay, so there's another question that um, I have a question regarding the proton system mentioned in the beginning of the lecture. Isn't a proton a spin one particle making it a three level system? How can it be used as a qubit? No, the proton the, is a spin half particle. It's a two level quantum system. The proton is spin half. If you, it's the hydrogen nucleus, which is proton, it's spin half. If you have a proton and a neutron together, then that nucleus is a spin one system that is called deuterium. So proton is a spin half system. It's a fermion. Okay, so um, Madiha has asked that is there any experiment to observe a qubit in lab? Oh, yes, of course, uh, we, we always do that there. If this is not experimentally achievable, then this is totally of no use. In fact, experiments describe this notation, they motivate this notation. And we look at an example tomorrow. Of course, everything is experimentally observable. 
uh, it's verified by experiments. In fact, experiments motivate this notation. All right, so tomorrow we'll talk about interferometers uh, and uh, we'll, we'll bring home some of these ideas and uh, I hope uh, you will have time to reflect on, on this material and inshallah we'll continue tomorrow. So I really like to thank everyone. All right, Mosna, I think I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. yeah, you may leave the meeting. Okay, um, just one miscellaneous remark that please check your emails. We may add you in a Google Classroom or um, to a forum in order to share reading materials or resources. So that's it. Thank you very much. You may leave.